All right, the reproductive system, just uh, real quickly, major function is to reproduce, right? So all the parts are compatible between male and female to make sure that that event happens. So we can see in this diagram here the major event of fertilization where sperm and egg come together is up here in the uterine tube or fallopian tube. So that's the site of fertilization. So if you think about the sperm have to travel from the male body up through the reproductive tract almost to the very end of it to that fallopian tube. So the egg is ovulated, released from the ovary here, travels a short distance and waits here for that sperm to fertilize it. Once it fertilizes it, it takes sometimes four to five days for it to make the descent down into the uterus and to embed in the uterine wall. So implantation occurs in the uterine wall and that's where baby grows. So like I said, it can take up to five days for that. And then once it embeds in that uterine wall, it can take up to five days more for the hormone that is detected in pregnancy tests to be found in the urine. It's found quicker in the blood but for it to be spilled out into the urine takes a little longer. So sometimes that's up to two weeks from the time of conception up here in the fallopian tube to the time it releases enough hormone to spill into the urine and get a positive pregnancy test. So if ovulation happens, happens midway through the cycle, a woman's menstrual period would begin two weeks after ovulation. So typically people say, you know, if they don't get their period, then they think maybe they're pregnant and they'll test. But if it so happened that that egg, they ovulated a little late that month and that egg didn't, and that fertilized egg didn't implant right away and it took a little time for those levels to go up, we see a lot of false negatives on pregnancy tests. So it's important that a woman test again and again and again to confirm a negative test rather than just assume it was negative, maybe she tested too early. It's very rare to have a false positive pregnancy test. And when I had my first child and I had that first test, um, I called into the clinic and I was all excited. Oh, I want to come in and be seen. You know, I got a positive pregnancy test. I'm like, okay, we'll see you in about three, or not, no, what was it, eight weeks? They didn't want to see me for, you know, a long time. And I thought, what the heck? Why didn't they want to, you know, I'm pregnant. We got to start doing everything, making the planning and, you know, confirming this. She said, no, that the over the counter tests are very accurate. So, we're not overly concerned about that. And on a negative side of that is some pregnancy losses are very common in the first eight weeks. So if you get everybody all excited and get all that intake and spend all that time and energy doing the testing and the educating, and then they lose the baby, you know, that's a lot of time wasted. So they want to wait until a pregnancy is a little further along, unless you're high risk and you've you know, been working with an endocrinologist to get pregnant, that's different. But typically couples, you know, they want to wait until they're about eight weeks along before they come in and start that process. So starting with the male, uh, the major organ of, of the reproductive system is the testes. So the job of the testes, two jobs. One is to make men, men, right? And that's testosterone. So without testosterone, they lack some of those male characteristics. Sometimes aggression is part of that. So we know animals get neutered, right? We remove the testes, so we don't have that aggression. Sexual drive is related to, related to testosterone. So some men who have a stronger sexual drive could be related to higher testosterone levels. We know that testosterone levels as we age go down. Some men have less of a sex drive. Doesn't mean they have no sex drive. So when you look at the elderly people in the nursing home, they're still looking at those younger CNAs and recognizing, you know, the natural attractions that can occur as a result of testosterone. Um, so they do still have those needs to some degree, but it definitely declines as we age. Um, so sperm leave the seminiferous tubules of the testes. That's the specific location where they're formed. They travel up the vas deferens, out of the external area where testes are located, and then up over the bladder and they hook up with the ejaculatory duct, which secretes some semen. Most of the semen is produced by the ejaculatory duct. It passes through the prostate and then through the main shaft of the penile urethra, membranous urethra, and out of the body. So if a person has a vasectomy, they make that incision here down low at the vest deferens in the scrotal sac. So it's a very minor procedure. It's done in an office, you know, not in a surgical suite, and recovery is about just one day, just putting some ice, keeping the ice on the scrotal area, 
and the recovery is very quick. So they're still making sperm, but the sperm can't travel up through that uterine, or through the vas deferens and beyond because it gets absorbed into the fluid around the testes because they're not in the tube, in, not in the ductwork anymore. And remember the Leydig cells, those interstitial cells which are found outside the seminiferous tubules but are still in the testes, they make that testosterone. Question? Yes. Yeah, testosterone. Yep, because testosterone, the, te the testes are also an endocrine organ. They make testosterone, they secrete that to the blood. So the vas deferens does not need to be intact for testosterone secretion. So they're very much male, does not affect anything other than the presence of sperm in the semen. Because if you look at the different components, these glands that contribute to semen production, most of it comes from the seminal, seminal vesicles, which are up inside the pelvic cavity and were not affected by the vasectomy. So if you examine semen from someone who has a vasectomy versus someone who does not, you might just find the semen's a little more transparent because it doesn't have the sperm cells in it. And that's one, th one way they verify that a vasectomy was successful is they ask for a semen sample and they verify that there is indeed zero sperm in there. Because sometimes those ends of the vas deferens come back together on their own and they recannulize, it's called, and sperm are flowing again and women have gotten pregnant from men who said they had a vasectomy. Uh, but now we try to be much more accurate where we take a large segment out, we cauterize the ends, sometimes they even clip the ends to make sure they're not going to find each other. And it can be very effective, 100% effective because of that. So the prostate gland is another gland. It has a job secreting enzymes, secretes citrate, which is a nutrient source for those sperm as they travel through the male reproductive tract and then beyond into the female reproductive tract. We know the prostate gland is at risk for cancer in men. So it secretes a, a, an enzyme called PSA, and when those PSA levels get really high, we know the prostate is cancerous because there's these abnormal growth of cells secreting too much PSA. So then they'll have the prostate removed, and then the way to verify that we completely removed it, PSA level should be? Ideally? Zero. zero. Yeah, yeah. So if you look at the location of the prostate gland, it wraps right around the urethra as the urethra exits the bladder. So if you have no prostate gland, it's a little flaccid and kind of not real stable, that urethra. So men have trouble with dribbling and holding back urine. They have a trouble with, with that ability. So you might see that in older patients that have had their prostate removed. If it's enlarged, which is really common in men as they age, they have trouble emptying their bladder because this is a narrowed space right as it exits the bladder. And the more they push or try to you know, put pressure to make the urine go, the more that enlarges the prostate and causes more difficulty. So that's a real problem with some men. Some men need a straight cap to completely empty their bladder because of enlarged prostate. So looking at the bulbourethral gland, that's just below the prostate. It's a small set of glands. Its job, these little brown glands here on this diagram, um, it, and right here it's that small little swelling right there. But the job of these glands is to lubricate the tip of the penis prior to insertion into the female. So this is released prior to ejaculation during the arousal period. And what we have found, though, is that there is some seminal fluid that can come through early with the secretion of the bulbar urethral gland, and there is semen, I'm sorry, there have been sperm identified in that early secretion. So some people that use the withdrawal method as a form of birth control, only like 40% effective. So. Um, looking at testosterone again, it's what makes males males, so that increases at puberty and that's when boys start to get deepening voices, enlargement of the genitals, axillary hair, um, facial hair, all those changes that occur with um, puberty. But now people that inject steroids because they want a big muscle mass, because you know it does cause increased protein synthesis to make big muscles. So if they're injecting steroids, the brain says, oh, we got enough testosterone going on in this body, the hypothalamus. So it does not stimulate the anterior pituitary to secrete FSH and LH. So testosterone production in the, in the testes goes down. And the, the testes um, have their own little blood supply and as a result of that, if we have less testosterone down there in the testes, then the genitals actually shrink in size. 
So for males that are produce, using artificial hormones, steroids for big bodybuilding, they might be big and muscular on the outside, but down in the genital area, they're actually shrunk. And testosterone, or sperm production goes down. So if they're trying to conceive, they're gonna struggle with that as well. So it's not good to mess with our normal hormone balance, right? Um, so then we just look at you know the different uh, reflexes related to intercourse for men. Erection is a result of parasympathetic domination. So you know foreplay and all that, whatever thoughts, sights, sounds, touch, you know stimulates erection. That's a parasympathetic nervous system dominating. Then the switching over to ejaculation is the sympathetic response and it's a reflex which means the brain can enhance it but it's not required so can a person who is a quadriplegic father a child yeah they can the natural way they can they can it's more difficult because oftentimes sensation is part of the arousal part you know to achieve full erection but it is possible it's a reflex so if you think about the, the reflex then, the, the response to that, you know, um, so, so uh, parasympathetic is arousal and sympathetic is ejaculation. So if you look at what is the sympathetic response, dilated eyes, dilated airways, rapid heartbeat, you know, suppressed digestion, those are all things happening at orgasm for the male. And after ejaculation, the response, and I use the example of the deer at the, at the pond during the rut season. Think about if you're trying to design a male and female body to be compatible. So what happens to the male? The male does his thing. He inserts you know, uh, his semen into the female. Orgasm occurred. Is it, would it be wise to keep that male turned on with sympathetic stimulation after he's deposited the sperm in the female? No, because the job is done, right? And the job of the reproductive system is to fertilize the female and promote reproduction, right? So as a result of that, when the sympathetic response is done and ejaculation has occurred, the nervous system of the men is depressed. It's like giving them a, you know, a stiff shot of alcohol. All of a sudden they're very tired, no interest in intercourse at that moment. You know, there's a, we call it, there's a refractory period where um, eja our erection is not able to occur because everything, remember, epinephrine was released, so it's in the bloodstream. It takes a while for that to break down and then to start the process over again. So these movies that, you know, they go all night long, that's physiologically impossible because of that period, of, that refractory period. And now let's think about the woman. So the woman, let's say that she, and, and we know that animals go into heat and they do feel, and women too, around ovulation, feel a greater sex drive. And so let's say the female orgasms. What would be the benef Would it be beneficial for her to be lazy and tired and want to go to sleep? No. Where, what should she do right after she's been fertilized? Run, right? Run and hide, right? Because <laughs> she's got to develop this baby now. We don't want her to be hanging out at the water, you know, maybe being attacked by another male who, you know, wants to do the same. You know, fertilization took place. So we want to protect this female now who has this sperm in her, so she needs to go run and hide. That's her job as a female. Is to, and look at your animals, your female cats versus your male cats. Who are more snarky and hiding under the bed most of the time? The females usually are, right? Because that's their job, is to not be out there laying on their back in the middle of the living room because they might be killed out in nature, right? So, and that's not always the case, but we tend to see that. So the female, after she has orgasm, is jazzed up. Now think of that in in real life scenarios, right? Guy and girl get together, they each orgasm, guy wants to go to sleep, the girl says, what, don't you love me? You don't care about me? I want to talk. Let's solve the problems of the world, right? <laughs> it's not physiologically compatible though, so it's nobody's fault. The female's designed for sympathetic stimulation as well, but she's a little fired up, where the male, it actually is a depressant once they have that orgasm. So <laughs> these are things you never talk about at your doctor's office, right? But it's a reality, and we set up unrealistic expectations for one another. Okay, real quick. Um, female, key concept here is that her job is just to nurture that baby. So she produces an egg. She doesn't need millions of sperm. Mil males need millions of sperm because they have a long way to travel. One gets the egg. Women release one egg. 
from one ovary every month. And it switches back and forth. It's not always left, right, left, right. It might be left, left, right, right, whatever. But one egg a month, two weeks after the menstrual period, or two weeks prior to the first day of red blood. So that's when a female is most fertile. And it can take the, the, the if, if you look at your worksheet, how many days can the sperm live in the female reproductive tract? Up to six days. So she can ovulate, you know, a week after intercourse took place and she can still become pregnant because those sperm are still in the reproductive tract waiting by it in that fallopian tube. Once it's ovulated, bam, they're there ready to go and fertilization took place. So that's, you know, we think that, you know, there's this mere tiny window for pregnancy, but it's actually much larger if we consider that extra time that the, males, that the male sperm can live in the reproductive tract. So with um, females, estrogen is what makes women women, and progesterone is what nourishes and, project and protects the endometrial lining. So take home message for some of you that don't have kids yet or you talk to your sisters, cousins, girlfriends that are having kids and having trouble. If you know someone who has early pregnancy losses, early bleeding, early in pregnancy, oftentimes it's as easy as fixing a progesterone level. Some women have low progesterone. So if they have early bleeding, Sometimes you call the doctor and say, well, it might be a miscarriage. Well, you'll wait and see. They won't do anything for you. But if you say, I'd like to come in and get a progesterone level checked, they'll do that for you. And it's as easy as correcting it with a simple medication for a couple of weeks until the, the uh, placenta takes over, then a person is in good shape. So I know more than one woman who has lost children, lost early pregnancies, just simply because of low progesterone. It could have easily been corrected. So don't forget that as you proceed through the rest of your lives talking to people and being in the healthcare environment. We'll see you on Thursday.